Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for the opportunity to um, talk with you today. Um, I am Lori Bishop. I'm going to talk with you today about managing the stress of caregiving. Uh, and I thought I'd start by sharing a little bit about my story. Uh, this is me and my dad. In 2015, my dad started having some symptoms of dementia. We didn't understand that until he was diagnosed, but it led me to do a lot of research and attend support groups. Uh, and eventually I was asked to become a trainer for the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving. Since that time, my mom has also been diagnosed. Uh, she's diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Uh, so I don't just educate caregivers, I am one. Um, I'm a certified financial planner by trade, but I'm very passionate about caregiver education. Uh, and being an advocate. So, um, you know, my goal is to help families like mine that are on this journey of caring for a loved one with dementia. And that's why, uh, that's why I'm happy to be here today. Um, there's a lot of material that we'll cover today. And uh, it comes from a portion of a workshop by the Rosalind Carter Institute called Dealing with Dementia. Um, in the next year, I know AARP has asked me to provide that across the state. And so once the threat of COVID's over, uh, you'll see some of these out there and I hope you'll find one that you can attend. But Rosalind Carter was a caregiver most of her life. Uh, and so helping caregivers is a passion of hers and is the mission of her institute. So um, let's talk about how to manage stress of being a caregiver. Um, so here are some questions for you. Uh, do you often say, I'm fine, even though you really feel off? Uh, do you focus on your loved one's needs and ignore your own? Uh, do you feel guilty when you take time to take care of yourself? And has being tired and worried become your new normal? Caregivers are well known for taking care of everybody but themselves. So starting today, my challenge to you is to take care of yourself. It's really not an option. It's really mandatory if you're gonna be a good caregiver. Um, I know you think I don't understand what your life is like, and I don't exactly, but I do know that all of us prioritize things in a day uh, that need to be completed. So at this point, taking care of yourself needs to find a place in that priority list. Um, so the rules of caregiving, if you insist on always putting others first and not accepting help from anyone, the stress of caregiving will hurt your health. Uh, so there are people who are willing to help you, so find them and let them. Um, I can tell you some stories of uh, caregivers that I know, one in particular, uh, her husband has Alzheimer's, she was on a walk with him one day, uh, turned around and looked at him and then just fell over. Um, he was, you know, of good mind enough to know to run, get a neighbor. And she had had a stage four brain aneurysm uh, with a 10% chance of survival. She did make it through that after several months. But um, all of us seem to think that, you know, if we're in good health right now, we'll be there to take care of our loved one. And that's not always true. We need to really focus on taking care of ourselves. So in order to manage stress, these are some of the things I'd like you to do first. And this is this is from the workshop, uh, the Roslyn Carter workshop. Um, think about why you don't take better care of yourself. Um, the answers may be obvious to you. It's because you don't have time and because your loved one needs lots of attention. Um, a lot of us were raised that to think we're supposed to put everybody else before us, especially if you're a mom. Uh, or if you had a good mom who seemed to do that all the time. Um, and the second question to ask yourself is, you know, why do I think this way? You know, is it because um, that's kind of the way I was raised? Is it because I think if I don't do that, people won't think I love them or that I care about my loved one? Um, so I challenge you to think about, um, think about taking care of yourself in a different way. Um, if you've identified, you know, why you don't take care of yourself and you kind of understand that, then, you know, the challenge is how do you turn that around? So I'm going to read from this. Um, you know, one of the things is, you know, an old way of thinking might be I don't have time to see my doctor um, about my headaches. And a new way to think about it is I need to take care of these headaches so I can take care of my mom or my spouse, um, or it could be, I don't have time to take a yoga class 
it's not fair for me to go and relax and have fun when dad is suffering so much. And a new way of thinking of that is, you know, a yoga class will help reduce my stress and dad will pick up on my calmer feelings. Um, so what's good for you is good for the person that you care for. Um, the next thing you want to do is set goals for taking better care of yourself. And I would keep those really short. Um, you know, for a lot of uh, caregivers, you know, eating a healthy meal is a challenge. Uh, you've got to get to the store, you've got to get fruits and vegetables, all those different things. And sometimes we just eat on the go, whatever we can get our hands on, and our bodies feel the effect of that. So if your goal is to eat healthier, you know, then, you know, come up with some small goal of eating two or three nutritious meals every, every day, or three times a week that you're going to cook at home and have, you know, something a little healthier. Um, but set goals, little things, little, little steps that you can, uh, can have big wins. The other is to solve problems that block your goals. Um, so if it's, for example, I don't have time to exercise, I'm too tired to exercise in the evening, then maybe you get up a little bit early, 15 minutes earlier and walk while your loved one that you care for is asleep before you get tired. You might ask a neighbor to, to come and sit with them while you go out for a walk. Um, the other thing, and this is kind of another, um, another subject completely, but I encourage you to build a care team. And that could be friends, family, neighbors, um, you know, and people who can provide some level of care or assistance to you. And so once you have that team in place and, and think of it that way, um, it could be professionals. It could be you hire somebody who provides in-home care as part of your care team, uh, but it would be a range of people. But think about ways that they can free up your time so you can do things to take care of yourself. Um, so the other thing I'm talking about is recognizing stress. So is your daily schedule so full that if one thing goes wrong, the whole day spins out of control? Um, is your blood pressure running high? Do you find yourself looking for cupcakes and chocolate to get through the day or coffee? Um, do you sometimes wish you could just crawl under the covers and hide? Those are normal feelings of a caregiver. Um, in fact, at the Rosalind Carter Center, they had a call one day uh, from a gentleman who asked, if I just leave her, this is his wife had Alzheimer's pretty advanced and um, she would wander in the night and, and uh, he just was exhausted. And he said, if I leave and just leave her alone, what happens to her? And the person who answered the call said, when is the last time you had a good night of sleep? And he said, I don't even remember. And she said, find somebody to watch her tonight and go to a hotel room or somebody else's house and get a good night of sleep and call me in the morning. And he did, and he said, I feel much better, I can do this now. So little things like that, um, you know, make a big difference. We feel stress a number of ways, and this, this chart kind of lays that out well. So if you look at body, mind, behavior, and emotions, you know, headaches, muscle tension, fatigue, even skin irritations, things like that, or getting, um, getting sick more often. Those are signs of stress. Um, if you're having problems making decisions, you're worrying a lot, you have a hard time concentrating or making decisions, that's a sign of stress. Um, if you're overeating, drinking more, uh, being restless, picking up habits, smoking more, things like that, that's a sign of behavioral stress. Uh, and then emotions, lacking your con lacking confidence, getting depressed, getting angry easier, being very anxious about things. All of those things, you know, can be signs of stress. Stress manifests itself in our body in a number of ways. Our body responds to stress by releasing a stress hormone. And as that level is, of stress hormone increases, it begins to affect different organs of our body. So stress hormones can damage your heart, your stomach, your liver, your mental health. So replacing unhealthy coping strategies with healthy stress management is really key to maintaining our health 
and being good caregivers. Um, so if we were in a workshop, I'd put these up on the screen and have you shout out, is this a healthy or unhealthy way of handling stress? But let's just look at these. Um, this obviously starting to drink is, is probably not the best way to handle stress. There are more productive ways. Um, eating well, eating a salad, eating something light uh, instead of something heavy and sugary that bogs us down. Um, you know, laying around on the couch, not, you know, getting up and taking care of yourself and, and uh, starting your day with a shower or something that makes you feel refreshed uh, is another negative way of handling stress. It's, it's a sign of depression, but um, anyway, running, getting some exercise uh, is a great way to handle stress. In fact, 20 minutes a day is ideal uh, for a caregiver if they can get that much in. Uh, sticking your head in the sand, uh, this is kind of a funny picture, but you know, some of us just don't want to deal with what's going on, and that's not a healthy way either. I mean, we're going to have to deal with it one way or the other. We've got to find a positive way to do that. Um, this slide, sleeping is uh, getting enough sleep is a very healthy practice, but sleeping abnormally long hours is an indication of depression. Uh, it's kind of one of those acceptable ways to hide from stress rather than face it. Uh, so I encourage you to get lots of sleep, but, um, but not end up on the couch like our earlier picture. Um, for a lot of us, food is comfort. Um, and so we turn to food when we're stressed. I am one who has a hard time with that. Can't, if I start eating candy, I know what is causing me to feel this way. I don't need to be doing this, you know, so, so you really have to think about it. Um, and then um, releasing stress is a good thing. But if you get get to the point where your smoke's coming out of your ears, you probably have gone a little too far. Uh, but it is good to vent and find places that you can talk and get things out of your system. Uh, and lastly, you know, some type of group exercise, socialization. Um, there are all kinds of um, exercises for, for seniors, folks who don't exercise a lot. You don't want to take up a Zumba class all of a sudden, but you want something. And, and I find that stretching, just sitting in a chair like this and stretching is very helpful. So a uh, great way to reduce stress. There are also other exercises that you can do. And so um, I hope you'll try all of these at least once. Twice would be better, but keep an open mind as to how it might make you feel. So uh, most people find at least one they enjoy and use on a regular basis. A signal breath to me is, um, you know, and a signal breath is where you, um, to the count of four, take a really deep breath in, hold it for four counts, and then blow out of your mouth to the count of four. So at the pace of about one, two, three, four, um, doing that will do amazing things if you're worked up if you're frustrated angry anxious um, and it's something you can do anywhere you can sit in your car and do this you can run into a restroom and do this you can actually just turn your back to the situation and do that it doesn't take but a minute but it causes your body to relax in a lot of different ways so i, I would that's the simplest and one of the easiest things that um, i would encourage you to try Music is another, I'm a music person, so um, I know that I'm depressed if I'm in my car and I'm not playing some kind of happy music. Um, so, um, and music also, particularly for somebody who has dementia, music, uh, the area of the brain that, you know, has memory of music and songs is one of the last thing that goes. Um, so you might find somebody with Alzheimer's or some type of Lewy body dementia, any, any type of dementia that um, really doesn't know any of their family members. They don't know their own name, but if they've been to church all their life and somebody puts on Amazing Grace or starts singing it, they'll start singing it with them. Uh, it's amazing how that happens, but, you know, so it may bring peace to you and to the person that you care for. Um, so a double, a double win. Stretching, like I mentioned earlier, uh, just before you get out of bed, even laying and, and stretching as, as much as you can would be great. Uh, or I find myself doing that during the day, too, when I think about it. 
uh, to put my hands over my head and just take a good stretch uh, because we hold stress in our shoulders and our back and, and all around. Guided imagery, uh, and sometimes that's <clears throat> you can do their apps on your phone and things like that. But, you know, things as simple as, um, you know, I think back to a vacation my husband and I took uh, in the Caribbean and a hammock by this gorgeous blue water and this breeze blowing. And I picture that in my mind. I can hear it. I can see it in my mind. I can have that feeling of when I was there. And sometimes just having that mental vacation for a few minutes can kind of help calm you down and, and release some stress. Um, adding fun back into your life. I'm, I'm an artist, so I, here's my picture of painting. Um, that's something that I enjoy and it is something that I can do and it takes my mind off other things. Um, so, you know, whether it is knitting or um, fishing or whatever it might be for you, finding time, maybe getting somebody on your care team to take care of your loved one and letting you go out and do something fun once a week even uh, is a great way to handle and, and, and keep your stress level down. Uh, meditation is another one. I'm going to put up another slide here. Um, the Curtin Kriya meditation method is, um, is one that there's been a lot of research done that um, that proves that it's helpful in relieving uh, particularly dementia caregiver stress. That um, the scientists did had one group of caregivers that practice meditation every day for six weeks and another group that just relaxed and listened to music at the same time. And at the end of that six weeks, the caregivers who practice meditation were significantly had significantly reduced depression scores than the other group. So um, that type of meditation, you know, a lot of people, so we're here in the Bible Belt, you know, and, and they think that's some new age something. And it's, it, don't think of it that way. Think of it as, um, you know, the lady who's on this picture where she's got her hands out. Basically, you take your thumb and you touch each of your four fingers and you, um, in, in the original meditation program, there are syllables that you say, but um, you can say, peace be with me, let love guide me, um, you know, help me calm down. There's all, but four words that you can say over and over that will help you um, focus on your breathing and take your mind off other things. When I used to be, um, it used to be that when I heard the word meditation, I thought you have to sit there and be quiet for, for a period of time. And my mind goes all day, every day. So that was very difficult for me uh, to think of it that way um, and to sit and do that. But once I have something to focus on, for me, I'll take one word like the word joy or the word love or peace, something that's very calming. And I'll focus on that. And I'll, I'm very visual. So I think of all the things that bring me joy, my granddaughter, uh, the beach, changing leaves in the autumn, so things like that. So you might try that. Um, it's also good for people that you care for. So if, if you can get them to do that with you, uh, it's, a, it's a double win. Um, so let's talk about asking for help. Um, you know, most of us know we need help, but sometimes it's hard to ask for that, even though we know we need it. Um, so, you know, the questions are, do you think that if you ask for help, people think you don't know what you're doing or that you don't care enough for your loved one? So, um, so one of the, the keys to asking for help is how you communicate that. And um, there are four types of communication, passive, aggressive, passive, aggressive, and assertive. And we, wanna, we want to be assertive, but let's look at the others because um, we've got some great examples here that came out of the Rosalind Carter book. So if you're talking to a cousin, let's say this cousin's name is Sarah, and you've been helping take care of your Uncle Frank, her father. Um, so if you went to Sarah and you said, I know you're too busy to help with your dad, Sarah, 
do what you can. I'm already taking care of Uncle Frank 24 seven. So no worries. That's very passive. I mean, basically you're coming across as being unimportant and submissive and being passive doesn't get you what you need or what you want. People will feel like they can walk all over you and ignore what you say. So they don't even bother to, to listen or ask what you need or what your opinion is. Um, aggressive communication, same situation uh, with your cousin, Sarah, and your uncle, Frank. Um, if you go to Sarah and you say, you're the most selfish woman I've ever laid my eyes on, Sarah. You don't even help your own dad. Here I am working my fingers to the bone, looking after him without any help from you. Who cares about your finals in college anyway? It's not like anyone would hire such a selfish person. Now, I hope that none of you would talk like that. But what you're really saying in that situation is that your needs are more important than Sarah's. And you come across as being a bully or self-righteous or superior. And being aggressive doesn't get us what we want either. It just makes people feel threatened or angry. Uh, and they'll avoid or oppose you. Um, passive aggressive would be talking about Sarah, saying, man, I can't believe Sarah. She she's says she's busy every day and can't spare 15 minutes to look after her own dad while I take a break. Of course, I had to say, yes, I understand, cousin Sarah. What else could I have said? So what you're saying there is, I don't dare say, you know, that my needs are more important than yours, but I'll complain about it. Um, and you'll come across to other people as somebody who just complains and, and talks about other people. What we're looking for is not any of those. We want assertive communication. So saying something like, I need help looking after your dad, Sarah. I know you're busy with finals. I respect that. But we should discuss how we can both meet our needs. Let's talk about it over tea Saturday at three o'clock. And what you're saying there is all of our needs are important. Um, and you come across as self-confident and direct and honest. So being assertive, uh, not ag aggressive, but being assertive is one of the ways uh, where you'll be most successful in getting assistance that you might need. Um, I have brothers who don't live here, um, and I have a lot of responsibility for my parents. And so occasionally I, I have those feelings of anger and bitterness uh, that come up. We're all human. And and I have to stop and stop myself and think, what do I expect of them? They don't live here. They one has, you know, runs a big law firm and he has two teenage kids who are very busy people. So um, the other is retired and helping a son run a business. They, they have busy lives, too. Um, so I have to learn to compromise and find ways that work in ways that don't make them angry. Um, so assertive communication is not being bossy and loud. It's being open and honest with mutual respect. It's stating directly what your thoughts and feelings and needs are. Uh, it's not begging, blaming, or bossing other people. It's telling them what you need and why. And it's also respecting what they have to say, whether you agree with them or not. So um, as far as getting help, and that's kind of, you know, in a caregiving role, Bottom line is we can't live our lives and do everything for another person. Uh, so once you, you know, think through how am I going to ask this question, then you want to make a plan to ask for help. So um, I want to encourage you to make a list of needs and wants and break those tasks, big tasks down. Well, I said small on the screen, it says small tasks in a small task, big task into smaller tasks. An example would be, um, if you have, you're caring for somebody who has mobility issues um, or somebody who has dementia, then, you know, let's say you want to make a house dementia friendly. Then, you know, there's other tasks like you make signs and arrows. You put up signs and arrows around the house so they know where the bathroom is when they can't remember. Um, you might want to buy dark rugs for out, outside doors. The reason you do that is because uh, for a lot of seniors, uh, particularly those with dementia, if you put a dark rug outside of your door, when they open the door to wander, uh, which is what you're trying to prevent, it looks like a hole to them. So they'll avoid going out. So there are different things like that or buying door alarms or installing door alarms. Those are all small tasks that somebody other than you could do. So um, make that list. 
and then go through and highlight tasks that only you can perform and seriously think about it. You know, what if you're out of the picture? Who else could do those things? And narrow it down to the things that only you at this particular time can do. For me, I used to have people who had income care companies say, oh, yeah, we can come help you. I'm like, that. my problem is not, you know, with cooking or things like that. At that time, my mom could do that. My problem was they have timeshares that need to be managed or sold or something has to happen with those. And, and um, some problem with the utility bill or, you know, mom doesn't know how to use her cell phone and, or she messes up the remote on the TV, all those kinds of things were all little things that built and built and built on, on my husband and I. And so we were able to find ways and, and work to find ways to do that. So think about who can help you with various tasks. Uh, get your care team involved and that is family, friends, professionals. Uh, talk with other caregivers. I, I highly recommend caregiver support groups, either online or in person. In person is great because it gets you out of, of way, you know, so that you have a little bit of a break. Uh, but nobody understands what you're going through like another caregiver. So, um, so talk with them, get their ideas and what they've used and what services and resources in the community are available. Uh, pick a time to make that request. And, and when somebody agrees to help you, show appreciation. Um, the other thing I want to talk about with um, managing stress is caregiver depression. Um, you know, a lot of caregivers feel hopeless. They get irritable, impatient. Uh, they just quit. They lose interest in doing things that used to be fun to them. Um, you know, if you've been sad more than two weeks, if you just really are not yourself, then you may have clinical depression. And that is very, very normal in the world of caregivers. So, um, so it's something that you don't wanna just continue to ignore. Uh, it's not something that we can just hope goes away and, and magically it will because, you know, most of us are dealing with a progressive situation, not always something that's gonna get better quicker. Uh, for those of us dealing with dementia, you know, looking ahead, is, it's only looking at it getting worse. Uh, and that's really hard to deal with if you don't find ways to do that. So, um, you know, a lot of people don't, you know, want to take medication. Uh, medication a lot of times helps. So if you talk with your doctor, they might uh, suggest something and try a few things to see if that will help. Uh, there are also non-medication ways that you can deal with depression by um, kind of changing your focus, focus on the positive and not the negative letting go of things you can't control, you know, even getting rid of clutter. Um, for me, I, you know, go 90 to nothing all day and I'm a creative person. So I make lots of messes, but, but clutter and having things look like chaos only adds to my feeling of chaos. So I've learned that when I have that feeling of things are out of control, one thing I can do is straighten things up, put things away and, and have that visual clutter, you know, out of the way. And then that helps me with stress relief. So uh, sticking to a routine, connecting with other people. I will tell you that um, if you're on Facebook, there are so many different, uh, you know, groups that you can ask to join. I mean, for me, I have uh, two that are caregiver related, uh, people taking care of parents or loved ones with dementia. And, and I can get on there and, say, you won't believe what happened today, and 300 people will reply back and encourage me, you know, so uh, it doesn't matter, you know, where they are, they're going through the same thing you're going through, and, and uh, so it's, it's always good to connect with other people, whether it's online or, or out in public. Exercise we talked about before is great for depression, um, and focusing on positive, uh, positive thoughts. Um, Caregiver grief is um, a very real thing, um, particular with any type of dementia or um, a chronic illness, cancer, things like that. You know, it's that knowing that you're, you're going to lose your loved one and thinking about that while they're still alive. Um, 
you know, worrying about how that disease is going to affect your loved one next and having a hard time enjoying the time you have because you worry and think about what lies ahead. Um, you know, on the left of this screen is a, the ball of grief and it um, is kind of this grief as a tangled ball of emotions. And so you can kind of see all different emotions here, whether it's anger or sadness or uh, feeling at loss of control, things like that. Um, you know, you are losing things. You're you know, you're losing the ability to do what you used to do, to have time to do things you used to do. You may be, um, you know, just feeling like intimacy may be gone. Your privacy may be gone. There are lots of things that you might grieve as a caregiver. Uh, and it's just kind of a series of losses a lot of times. So um, it's it can be as painful as death because it seems to go on and on. And, and I'll tell you, a lot of caregivers feel relief when their loved one passes. And you feel guilty thinking that, but that's a very normal thing. Um, I talked to a friend of mine from college uh, yesterday whose mother had passed away. His dad had passed away a year or so ago. And it devastated him. His mom had Alzheimer's and he come and goes, yeah, I told you mom died, right? And I'm like, yeah, you don't seem as upset as when your dad passed away. And I understand why. He said, yeah, I lost her years ago. Um, and so that, you know, as sad as it is, understand that grieving and that grief process can start long before you lose a loved one. Um, so resources that, um, that you might take advantage of to help with your loved one would be adult day services. Uh, I wish there were more of those, but places where you can um, drop off your, lo your loved one to have good care for the day. Um, some activities to have a good meal um, and have some socialization. Those are great services. Uh, so you might check, you know, in the area and see what's available to you there. In-home care services. There's some who, um, let's say you have trouble helping your loved one get a shower. I mean, there's some that will come in and just help shower several times a week or, um, you know, may just be their companion while you go out and go to a support group. Uh, there are residential care facilities, uh, and that could be assisted living. Um, it could be could be nursing home care. It could be a rehab center. Um, there's also hospice care. Palliative care is another one. Uh, and don't think of hospice care as if I call in hospice, that means you know my loved one's about to die. That's not true. Uh, most people I know who call on hospice say, I wish I had called them six months ago uh, because they come in and they they minister to all the needs of that hospice patient. They, you know, spiritually and, you know, from an emotional standpoint and physically and and their goal is to help them have the last you know, months of their life. And sometimes it lasts two or three years. People can re-up hospice. Um, it just calls for a terminal diagnosis, uh, which, you know, many, many people have. Um, the other thing I, I would ask that, going back to support groups, I would ask people in support groups in your area, who do they use? Where do they find, you know, assistance? Um, and don't always think that you can't afford it. You might be surprised um, at the cost of some of these things. Uh, and there's also assistance a lot of times to pay for, for things like that. Um, resources to help you. The Office on Aging, I tell you, is really one of the best places to learn about resources available in the community. Um, but I've listed some here, support groups, respite care. Respite care is um, a lot of assisted living facilities will have respite care rooms. And you can let your loved one stay there while you go take a vacation or just have a week at home by yourself for a few days. They will have them uh, in a furnished room. They'll provide their meals. They'll manage their medication. You can even go visit them. Um, and sometimes, you know, we've had people who would take their loved one to respite care. When they picked them up, they said, I want to stay here. I made some friends. So it's, you know, I did that with my dad and it was kind of hard because I thought, does he think I'm leaving him here forever? Um, and he actually did very well. So um, education, there are lots of opportunities for education. Um, 
you know, this program uh, that you're in today. Alzheimer's Tennessee has a number of programs. AARP has a number of programs. Um, you know, um, different workshops that that come along the deal with dementia workshop and we have those available is excellent that's i loved it it's one of the reasons i became one of the the trainers um you know your care team is another resource for you therapy we had a um, at caregiver cafe we have speakers come in and we had a lady who is a therapist and she specializes in working with caregivers uh and she was you know very interesting and uh, a lot of people just feel like they couldn't live without her. She helps them get perspective and and kind of guides them on, on personal issues. Uh, exercise classes, yoga, meditation, we've talked about those. Uh, religious organizations, churches. Sometimes, you know, caregivers can't get out to go to church and there are a lot of churches who uh, will reach out and and uh, visit people in the home and, and offer services that way. Um. So that's, that's all I have on this. I will say before we kind of open it up for questions, um, if you're interested in dealing with dementia workshop or the caregiver cafe, you're welcome to, to email me and, and I'll send you some information. I can get that uh, through Angela as well. And, um, but I am thrilled to have been here today. I hope this was helpful. So with that, I'll open it up for questions.